Okay, well, let's start. I'm uh, Dr. Honig. Uh, I, I'm at Columbia University, where I'm a professor of neurology, and I'm going to talk to you today about novel treatments for patients with Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to start by doing a little bit of a summary of uh, Alzheimer's disease, and then talk about some of the treatments that uh, are available and, uh, and that, will be, uh, that are uh, being investigated. First, I do have some disclosures. I will be discussing some investigational drugs and off-label usage of drugs. So, dementia in the elderly is far and away most commonly Alzheimer's disease. About 60 to 90 percent of cases um, are Alzheimer's disease. But there's a variety of other conditions which cause dementia, which we're not going to talk about today. And a variety of these overlap with Alzheimer's disease in the sense that a person with Alzheimer's disease can also have dementia with Lewy bodies. So these are not uncommon to have vascular uh, injury together with Alzheimer's or to have Lewy bodies together with Alzheimer's. But today we're going to be talking about Alzheimer's disease. And as you know, Alzheimer's disease is a radically increasing uh, uh, disorder, and it's increasing not so much because the incidence rate is increasing at a given age rate. There's actually evidence that perhaps slightly the opposite is occurring, but because there's so many more elderly people in the country year by year and, as, uh, and decade by decade. So as we have more elderly people, we'll unfortunately have more people with Alzheimer's disease until we find a more successful treatment to uh, prevent it or treat it. Alzheimer's disease is preeminently a disorder of cognition, including memory, language, motor changes, sensory changes, executive changes. But there's also changes in behavior and in function. On the left side here, you can see behavioral things such as agitation, aggression, wandering, depression, sleep disturbance, delusions and hallucinations. These are all behavioral abnormalities which we're accustomed to seeing in Alzheimer's disease and, and a consequence of the disease just like the cognitive changes are. Likewise, on the right side, you see functional changes. Nowadays, most people ascribe to work to a later age, and of course, loss of employment and uh, financial difficulties, difficulties driving or negotiating the subway system are, uh, are big functional changes that can occur in people with Alzheimer's disease. So how do we diagnose Alzheimer's disease? I think you're fairly familiar with the fact that we have to do a history and examination as well as some auxiliary testing, just like any other medical condition. Of course, the history is focused on changes in cognition and memory specifically, on changes in language, on changes in behavior and function. And uh, the examination is likewise heavily focused on mental status. I like this slide because on the right we see sort of the sequence of some of the things that occur with a patient afflicted by Alzheimer's disease, including memory loss, spatial disorientation, uh, dishevelment, circumlocutory speech, and then finally the terminal phase, which is often a mute, bedridden, and incontinent stage, uh, regretfully. I put Ronald Reagan on the left there because, of course, he suffered from Alzheimer's disease, and some people argue uh, that he might have suffered even when he was president from the beginnings of this disorder. So what about mental status testing? Of course, mental status testing involves testing consciousness, level of consciousness, attention, concentration, but very strongly language, orientation, memory, visual-spatial function. It's harder to test things like analytic abilities, judgment, and insight, but those are also things that we want to try to get insight into, not to make a pun. After the history and examination, we, of course, do auxiliary testing. And nowadays, it's standard of care to pretty much do some sort of structural imaging, MRI being the most common, although CT is sometimes acceptable. Uh, and we see on the left here an MRI machine. I have no interest in, uh, financial interest in GE. But on the right, you see an MRI of a person with Alzheimer's disease. The signs are not specific on an MRI, but we've grown to learn that when there's significant temporal atrophy, as there is here, and uh, significant parietal atrophy, uh, certainly that could be consistent with Alzheimer's disease, but not specific by any means. We have more specific tests that are useful, positron emission tomography, either PET or SPECT. Both are functional imaging, which show a typical biparietal and bitemporal uh, decline in brain function, even in regions that don't look structurally so devastated. So here you can see that there's not an even cortical ribbon of signal, 
but rather that the metabolism in the parietal regions is down. Similarly here on the sagittal image, you can see that the sensory and motor areas are relatively preserved, the occipital area is relatively preserved, but that the temporal areas, parietal areas, and frontal areas are lower metabolic activity, consistent with a pattern consistent with Alzheimer's disease. Of course, nowadays we have fancier sorts of PET scanning. Many of you are familiar with uh, amyloid imaging. Amyloid imaging is a technique which allows us to actually see the stuff of Alzheimer's disease in the brain. And we can see uh, in the living person the signs of plaques. These are four agents, the first of which is investigational only, PIB, but the other three of which are FDA uh, labeled for, uh, for uh, determining whether a person has moderate uh, to frequent neuritic plaques, such as we see in Alzheimer's disease. These are flubetabem, flubetapir, and flutametamol, the three licensed agents uh, for amyloid imaging, even uh, if they're not uh, necessarily reimbursed by insurance. So in addition to the history and examination and basic structural imaging and perhaps functional imaging, there's also cerebral spinal fluid, which is extremely helpful in, uh, in allowing us to go and exclude inflammatory infectious disorders, but also in determining whether the pattern of markers is such that we would see, is that such a, like we would see in Alzheimer's disease versus some other disorder. And this just shows you that in general the Alzheimer's pattern is of low A-beta, high total tau, and high phosphor tau. So what's going on in the brain that's causing these changes, these changes in cognition, behavior, and function that we pick up on history and examination and neuroimaging? Well, I think you all know that there's plaques and there's tangles. These are the preeminent pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And indeed, the treatments we're going to talk about in the next few minutes uh, relate to uh, trying to intervene uh, in these plaques and tangles. Those are the treatments of the future, the novel treatments that we hope will attack this disease. So up here, these are different ways of looking at plaques. These little dots are not measles. This is higher magnification on a silver stain, and this is a higher magnification on fluorescent stain. These are plaques, which are extracellular accumulations of the protein beta amyloid. Down here, you see tangles. These are intracellular accumulations of the protein tau, seen here in electromicroscopic view. And the protein tau equally is a whole, this abnormal deposition of tau is a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. So the general, general consensus is that there's a cascade where we start with somehow increased beta amyloid, either through overproduction or decreased clearance or both. We get neuritic plaques, neurotransmitter changes, synaptic losses, neurofibrillary tangles based on the, with the tau protein, and finally cell losses and ultimately death. There's a variety of uh, measures that support that sort of cascade, including the various measures uh, that we have, the various tools we have, uh, biomarker tools, including cerebrospinal fluid that I just told you about, uh, PET imaging, uh, MRI imaging, and molecular uh, PET imaging. So let's talk now for the next uh, half hour or so about therapeutics, about how we uh, 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 treat Alzheimer's disease right now and how we might be able to treat it in the future. I should point out that there's a, a variety of terminologies I'll use, including the fact that uh, clinical drug trials uh, can, are, are, are generally uh, uh, categorized in terms of their phase. And we have phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one is an earliest trial, which involves simply trying to go and make certain that the drug is safe and get some rough idea of what levels of drug we might get at what doses. And, uh, and get some idea, if at all possible, about what uh, dose might be a, a potentially useful dose. Phase two is a more refined version of that. Now in hundreds of people, trying to find what dose might be safe and what dose might possibly be efficacious. The definitive trials of drugs are phase three trials. And that's uh, what we'll be talking about mostly today, although we'll be talking to some extent about phase one and phase two trials as well. First, I'd like to put the treatments of Alzheimer's disease in perspective. Um, you know, there's a spectrum of disorders in, uh, in neurology, and uh, there's some that are very eminently treatable right now, and that includes multiple sclerosis, the immune-mediated encephalo, uh, encephalomyelitides, uh, inflammatory neuromyopathies. Those we have really quite good treatments for right now. 
Then there are diseases that we have virtually no treatment for, things like stroke, traumatic brain injury. But once they occur, we have absolutely uh, no uh, uh, proven method uh, uh, or not even too many ideas at this point in time about how to go and uh, uh, somehow treat that injury to the nervous system. Then there's the degenerative diseases of the brain and, uh, and uh, the nerves and even the muscles where we feel we are uh, on the edge of being able to go and uh, come up with effective treatments. And of course, preeminent among those is Alzheimer's disease. And we'll be talking about some novel investigational treatments. So I characterize the Alzheimer's uh, therapies uh, in three groups. Uh, treatments of the past, which are just treatments for nonspecific disease symptoms. Treatments of the present that are proven, which are neurotargeted, neurotransmitter-based treatments. And treatments of the future, which are these novel treatments we'll be talking about, which involve treatment of the primary disease process, trying to intervene in that cascade that I told you about, either at the level of amyloid, at the level of tau, or some of the other levels of neuronal injury or others that I mentioned. So first, let's just briefly review treatments of the past. In the past, all we had was treatment for nonspecific disease symptoms. We are good at treating agitation, depression, anxiety, insomnia, and we have reasonably good drugs that can treat these, uh, treat these uh, rather disturbing uh, behavioral uh, features of Alzheimer's disease. Treatments of the present involve neurotransmitter-based therapies. So there's five treatments that have been approved by the FDA, four in common use, denepazil, galantamine, rivastigmine, and tacrin being the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, the latter virtually never being used uh, currently in the U.S., and memantine hydrochloride, or nemenda, uh, which is a different mechanism of NMDA glutamate receptor inhibition. So these drugs do actually cause a modest benefit in patients with Alzheimer's disease, but the uh, key is that it's modest and that it's not disease-modifying. It's simply a uh, small uh, benefit uh, in cognition and even in behavior and function uh, when people take the drug, which uh, disappears when they're not taking the drug. Why does this seem to work? Well, for the cholinergic drugs, we have a reasonably good understanding. There's this small nucleus, the nucleus basalis of minor, which sits in the middle of the brain, uh, deep down in the brain. It's the B on this diagram. And uh, that nucleus has cholinergic cells that extend their axons throughout the brain and seem to be, and that cholinergic tone seems to be responsible for some of our attention and uh, ability to, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and connects with the memory centers and other centers. So uh, this nucleus is particularly afflicted in Alzheimer's disease. When we use acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, what we're basically doing is increasing the cholinergic tone in the brain, sort of like a replacement therapy for the lost acetylcholinergic input due to those injured or dying or disappearing neurons in the nucleus basalis of Minard. Do these drugs work? Well, there's hundreds of studies which show these drugs work. Here we just have a representative diagram for denepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine. And I think you can see that in each case, the curves are rather monotonously similar looking. Namely, people on one dose of the drug do better than placebo, and people on a slightly higher dose of the drug do better than the people on that dose in general, um, uh, within reason anyway. Um, and the similar curves occur for memantine which is that basically over a period of six months, a common trial period for symptomatic medications, we do see uh, that there is a benefit of being on the drug versus being off the drug. There's every reason to believe this benefit is simply symptomatic and only lasts while people are on the drug, and it's not disease-modifying these drugs. Interestingly enough, not only do these drugs affect cognition, as I showed you in this slide, uh, but the drugs also can be shown, in some studies anyway, to have a modest benefit in terms of function and behavior. And, uh, uh, but uh, these are small effects. This is just galantamine for an example. Of course, these drugs have side effects. These uh, drugs can cause gastrointestinal side effects, sleep disturbance, muscle cramps, fainting, Parkinsonism, urinary frequency, uh, runny noses, and such. Uh, 
Lamantine has a different set of side effects. It's a different drug. It doesn't work on acetylcholine. It's a uh, activity-dependent NMDA receptor inhibitor. And uh, as such, it causes a different set of side effects, including constipation, dizziness, sedation, confusion. And I should point out that the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are approved for mild and moderate and, and even severe Alzheimer's disease, but memantine is only approved for moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease because that's the only uh, 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 levels of Alzheimer's disease severity in which has been shown to have any efficacy. We're going to talk now about the treatment of the primary disease process of Alzheimer's disease, which, as we talked about, involves amyloid deposition, tau deposition, um, there's different uh, features that you could attack in amyloid deposition, namely production or clearance and tau. You could prevent aggregation or propagation. You could imagine preventing the aggregation of amyloid, and that might be a good thing. You could imagine trying to protect neurons. Or you could imagine that inflammation might be involved in some sense. So there's a whole bunch of ideas. And the ones in bold here on the top are, uh, are still uh, currently active ideas uh, in terms of how to go and investigate uh, new therapies for uh, affecting uh, beneficially the Alzheimer's pathogenetic uh, cascade. So just to remind you of that cascade, again, we believe it starts with either increased production or decreased clearance, or probably both, of beta amyloid in the brain, that this excessive beta amyloid causes a variety of downstream effects, including abnormalities of tau, abnormalities of synapses, abnormalities of neurons, and the cognitive symptoms that we all understand and that we talked about earlier as part of the, the uh, symptoms and process of Alzheimer's disease manifestations. So the most exciting uh, uh, experiment in trying to modify the disease process of Alzheimer's disease, uh, at least the first most exciting experiment, was in 1999 by Dale Schenk, who unfortunately passed away recently, where he showed that by immunizing mice who were destined to get the mouse version of Alzheimer's disease through genetic engineering, by immunizing them against this beta amyloid protein, you could actually decrease its deposition. And others shortly thereafter, such as my colleague Dave Morgan, shortly thereafter showed that this actually beneficially affected their cognition and memory. So here in mice, um, you can see, uh, for example, and made the New York Times, uh, and you can see here there's a lot of amyloid protein, and here there's very little. So these are litter mates, these are brothers or sister mice, if you will, and you can see that those who were immunized really looked um, uh, much better uh, molecularly, and as Dr. Morgan showed, they also uh, did better in terms of remembering where they were when they were swimming in water. So that led to a whole bunch of experiments rather quickly in humans. Uh, including active immunization, just like the initial experiments were in mice, and then passive immunization. And I'll talk about a few of these. Active immunization first started out with the compound, uh, with the drug AM1792, but there's other ones, such as ACC001, CD106, and still other ones that are still under development. Um, this first uh, agent did not, uh, uh, w was not pursued after it became clear it showed uh, in about... Uh, 10 or 15, maybe 10 percent of people, an inflammatory encephalitis, which wasn't good. However, passive immunization, so active immunization is still a reasonable strategy. The drug ACC01 um, did not show this inflammatory uh, encephalitis, but did not show enough benefit uh, uh, such, that it's such that it's not being currently pursued. Some of these other drugs are still being pursued as strategies to try to influence Alzheimer's disease in humans by decreasing amyloid deposition by in provoking an immune response in the person itself. Passive immunization, however, has taken off as a perhaps slightly safer, although slightly more laborious, but potentially more controllable uh, process of trying to go and introduce into people, into affected Alzheimer's disease patients, an agent which would bind amyloid and cause its removal from the brain. And so there's bapanuzumab, solanezumab, cronezumab, gantanerumab, aducanumab, panezumab, and, and others. And um, each of these has slightly different characteristics. I'm going to go through a few of these drugs because these are the, novel, the beginnings of the novel treatments for Alzheimer's disease, that, uh, one of which we hope will eventually work, a couple of which have at least failed at one level or another.
So this is bapanuzumab. This was a phase two study looking at PET scans, amyloid imaging. And I think what you can see is that overall, um, there did appear to be uh, some uh, decline in uh, the amyloid uh, in the brain in people treated with the drug from the beginning of the uh, treatment uh, before they were exposed to the drug to a year and a half later. So here and here, there appears to be less amyloid on the right than the left. On placebo, it seemed like it was the opposite, that there was more amyloid with time, which is not surprising. So this sort of gave rise to the idea that maybe bapanuzumab or other antibodies really could clear amyloid from the brain of humans or prevent its uh, increasing deposition. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, phase three studies, which uh, I was involved in, uh, uh, did not uh, bear out a, a promise of clinical efficacy. You can see that the curves for bapanuzumab and placebo are basically superimposable. Uh, at the same time, there were side effects, and uh, this is what we call uh, aria, or amyloid-related uh, imaging abnormality, which is uh, edema of the brain. There were also little hemorrhages that could be seen, um, such as here. Uh, so basically, there were abnormalities in the brain, so we were giving people side effects regretfully in a percentage of cases, and we weren't seeing efficacy. So that led to this drug being abandoned. Perhaps we just didn't, weren't giving enough, but we couldn't give enough because when we gave more, we got more of these side effects. So that was the first amyloid clearing, clearing uh, novel strategy. And uh, as I say, uh, it didn't work at the dose it was uh, given, and we couldn't give more. However, there were some subtle hints that it might be doing something good. You can see that overall people with bapanuzumab on sub-study analyses did seem to have a little bit less phosphatau in their cerebral spinal fluid. And overall, there seemed to be some effects on brain volume and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and PET signal that suggested that maybe the drug was, doing its, uh, was uh, accomplishing some measure of action in the desired or designed uh, 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 fashion. So a more modern drug uh, of the same uh, category uh, that tends to attack fibrillar beta amyloid is called aducanumab. Um, many of you may have seen uh, in the news. And it is a drug which is ongoing in phase three testing right now. And certainly at a PET scan level, it seemed to have similar features to bapanuzumab, but even more striking in the sense that it really seemed to be reducing the amyloid in the brain. Uh, but at very high doses, it really seemed to have a lot of side effects. So uh, at the highest dose tested, 10 milligrams per kilogram, uh, over half of patients, or about half of patients, were having vasogenic edema or microhemorrhages or uh, serious uh, side effects, which were actually symptomatic, unlike some of the side effects, uh, like uh, the majority of the side effects seen in bapanuzumab. So this drug clearly uh, was active uh, at reducing amyloid, uh, but it was also clearly active at causing uh, side effects. We'll see what the results of that study, uh, ongoing study, which should come out in about 2020, uh, will show us. A different strategy of attacking beta amyloid is to attack soluble beta amyloid less than fibrillar. The idea here is that if we go and remove the beta amyloid and in, in smaller units, uh, maybe it won't get together to make uh, fibrillar amyloid. And maybe by sucking off soluble amyloid, so to speak, we might have decreased in the degree of plaques, period, due to some equilibrium effect. So in phase two studies, it looked fairly encouraging, at least by various analyses. You can see a separation of placebo and drug uh, in two different studies and in pooled results. Um, and uh, this was true in the mild cases. However, uh, it uh, has been given a phase three, uh, uh, actually that was phase two trials, I'm sorry, it was the first two phase two trials. Um, now in the third phase three trial, which I presented uh, this past fall, um, uh, December, uh, clearly the drug at the dose we were giving it did not show adequate efficacy. Uh, the good news is it showed no side effects uh, that we could tell whatsoever, but um, you can see the curves are not so impressive here. There's about 11% difference uh, in the uh, degree of decline in the ADAS cog, one of the cognitive tests. Similarly, there was a, you know, maybe a 15% decline, uh, a 15% difference in decline in the uh, CDR sum of boxes, a more functional measure. So this drug, solanezumab, which attacks soluble amyloid at this dosage of 400 milligrams every four weeks, 
roughly five milligrams per kilo every four weeks, roughly. Um, what it did is it maybe showed evidence of a very small beneficial effect on some of the cognitive and functional measures, but it did not uh, show enough evidence uh, nor uh, significant enough evidence uh, to go and warrant its pursuit at that dosage. Now this drug, unlike the other drug I told you about, the other two drugs I told you about, this drug did not have side effects, so you could argue that perhaps all we needed to do is give a lot more. And uh, I will uh, talk about that. Well, I guess I don't have a slide for that, but I will talk about that a little bit more. There's another drug called Crenazumab, which is very similar to Solanezumab, where we're giving much, much higher doses. And uh, instead of roughly 5 milligrams per kilogram, roughly 60 milligrams, exactly 60 milligrams per kilogram in a phase 3 trial. And that trial is ongoing at my institution and others around the country and world. So we'll hope that perhaps using a drug that can attack soluble amyloid might, without side effects, and so far it does seem to be remarkably side effect free, uh, remove amyloid from the brain and cause a clinical benefit, but that remains to be seen. What about other ideas? Well, somebody thought, well, what if we just put lots of immunoglobulin, period? Who cares if it's specific for amyloid? And that was a, a complete failure. Um, there was a lot of effort, a lot of, uh, a lot of interest, uh, uh, and there was a uh, large uh, national trial um, after some very tiny uh, trials, and uh, this shows you why you shouldn't do very, very tiny trials first. The first trials were 24 patients. Uh, then they went to 400 patients, or 390 to be precise, and it was complete failure. It showed absolutely no benefit whatsoever. So our, our supplies of IVIG are safe. Uh, <laughs> because some argued that if it had worked, we would have had enough to go and, uh, uh, from various humans around the world to treat all the Alzheimer's patients. But in any event, it was, not, it, was a, uh, it was an idea that did not work. What are the other ways of attacking beta amyloid? Well, you can imagine that we could attack production instead of try to go and increase clearance. And... Uh, uh, you could also argue that we could attack fibrillation before, uh, uh, and the fibrillation uh, agents have not worked. The two that have been tried are tramiprosate and uh, siloinositol. These drugs did not work. We were unsuccessful uh, at uh, influencing disease with these agents. It's not clear whether we were successful at influencing fibrillization. Uh, in vitro and in animal models, it looked like they might do what uh, they were designed to do, but it's not clear that they did, and the drug development has ceased. However, decreasing production is definitely something that looks very promising at this point in time. So we're talking about secretase inhibitors. There's two different enzymes called secretases, beta and gamma secretase, which together, when they act both on the same amyloid precursor protein molecule, cause the, um, uh, and allow the release of a beta-40, a beta-42, the, uh, the deleterious entities uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So you can imagine that by inhibiting one or the other of these enzymes, uh, it might be uh, beneficial in decreasing production of this A-beta-40 or A-beta-42, or both. And uh, that's what these uh, inhibitors do. They're protease inhibitors. We know that protease inhibitors work quite nicely for uh, hypertension. Uh, many of you use those in clinical practice. Or for HIV, where protease inhibitors have been, have been a really amazing advance in terms of preventing the uh, 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 HIV uh, pathogenetic uh, cascade. So protease inhibitors are, can work, amazingly enough. Amazingly, you can go and take pills in the mouth that affect your proteases in the body and uh, cause you to do less proteolysis in certain very specific ways. Quite impressive for HIV and hypertension, and it remains to be seen uh, how it will work for Alzheimer's disease. What we do know is that um, they do, uh, they do uh, work in mice and uh, tissue culture. The first such uh, protease inhibitor was actually a rather interesting one. It was a selective inhibitor that really just seemed to lower A-beta-42, terenflubil, and that did not work. Again, you can see that the curves of placebo and drug were rather remarkably superimposed. So that was uh, by now almost uh, eight years ago, and uh, it did not work. Furthermore, gamma secretase inhibitors, one of those two enzymes, well, a variety of them um, uh, underwent phase two and phase three trials, avogasistat and semigasistat in particular, and both of those um, actually seem to show a tiny bit of clinical worsening, but no clinical efficacy. So gamma secretase inhibitors at this point in time, at least those two gamma secretase inhibitors and a few others, are not a focus of our investigation, although it's still possible that there was something about 
the trials, namely uh, how specific their effect was or, uh, or possibly the exact dosing uh, regimen that caused uh, this worsening cognitively rather than benefit. It wasn't a major worsening, but it was definitely, uh, uh, definitely perturbing to find that a drug that we hoped would improve cognition actually worsened it. And that was true for both of those drugs, lending uh, support to the fact that it, had, that it was a real effect. But what about base inhibitors? These are the beta secretase inhibitors. And in fact, these are now the, uh, the drug class of greatest promise for inhibiting a beta uh, production or a formation. There's a variety of such drugs that are in uh, uh, phase three uh, or phase two slash three uh, development. Uh, Verubesistat by Merck and Avabesistat by AstraZeneca Lilly are two drugs that are uh, in late phase three, and we should have answers soon. What you can see on the panel on the right is that they really do work in changing the amount of A-beta rather significantly in the cerebrospinal fluid of patients uh, with Alzheimer's disease. So, uh, so the drugs do inhibit uh, production of A-beta. Uh, the question, of course, is whether that translates into a clinical benefit, and that's what the tests uh, that we're doing, both in terms of biomarkers and cognitive testing, should allow us to go and answer that question. So finally, what about other ways of trying to intervene in Alzheimer's process beyond uh, beta amyloid, beyond either affecting production or clearance of beta amyloid? Well, um, there was a drug that achieved a fair bit of, uh, of uh, press called uh, uh, LMTX or various uh, varieties of methylene blue. Um, and. Uh, I think at this point we can say with the release of several of the studies in the past year that these were a definitive failure. The idea of this drug was that it might decrease the amount of hyperphosphorylated tau. It also made people quite blue. That actually is a jar of urine on the right, and you can see it was very blue, which was very disturbing to patients. Also very hard to keep people blinded because if they had a lot of the drug, they were very blue, and if they had less of the drug, they were less blue, and if they had no drug, they weren't blue. <laughs> Um, but, um, but the drug really failed. It was tried in both Alzheimer's disease and, interestingly, in front of temporal dementia with the presumption that some fraction of those were tau uh, disorders, which some fraction are. But the drug uh, did not work uh, in showing any uh, drug placebo uh, benefit when analyzed uh, uh, in, in such a fashion of analyzing drug versus placebo or low dose versus high dose. Um, what about other things? Uh, well, let's just talk about tau for a moment. And that does not mean that tau doesn't, uh, anti-tau treatments shouldn't work. Um, we have a variety of phase one and now phase two trials ongoing to try to intervene in tau in other ways. And it probably will not be a great surprise to you that what we're doing is using antibodies again, just like we've looked so promising in mice and possibly in humans for amyloid, using antibodies to try to intervene in, uh, in the process of, uh, of, uh, of tau propagation uh, during Alzheimer's disease. In terms of other things, there's a whole bunch of other things that have been tried and they don't work. So a whole bunch of vitamins, estrogens, ginkgo, uh, statins, uh, medical foods, fish oils, none of which have shown any efficacy whatsoever. I show here just ginkgo biloba, which finally underwent a, a $10 million or so dollar trial in the United States, sponsored by the National Institute of Health, and it showed absolutely no benefit whatsoever, after prior trials also showed no benefit. Anti-inflammatory agents are a fond hope that since we are so good at treating inflammation and since inflammation treatment is so valuable in disorders such as multiple sclerosis and some of the other disorders I mentioned earlier, would, they, would it be any benefit to decrease inflammation in Alzheimer's disease? And that was sort of partly what the IVIG ID was also, not the specific antibodies, of course, but the idea that gross immunoglobulin might be beneficial. Uh, but in fact, these drugs have all failed. So every non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, anti agent and, and prednisone itself, the ultimate anti-inflammatory agent, uh, uh, these have all failed completely. And if anything, in a few cases, made people a tiny bit worse. There's been a lot of talk about Alzheimer's somehow being related to diabetes. And uh, that's because there's not much doubt that people who have diabetes 
um, uh, uh, seem to have more Alzheimer's type symptoms and whether it's an additive effect or somehow an interactive effect is not clear. But there have been a variety of trials about whether Alzheimer's might be affected by diabetes type drugs. And that includes rosiglitazone and metformin. And these drugs so far have failed. And uh, insulin being another one, I think I might have a slide on that. Here it is, insulin. Um, and uh, the results were really all over the place. It's still under trial, this time giving insulin in the nose, um, but it's really not at all clear. You can see the things go up, down, and around. Uh, here we've got zero, 20, 40 international units. Not really clear that there's any uh, 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 effect of insulin on Alzheimer's uh, uh, cognitive measures. Medical foods, I won't uh, go through this in detail, but they also have not worked. Finally, coconut oil. Even better than a medical food, on your grocery shelf, as you go to a checkout counter, you see coconut oil. And uh, there was this lady who thought her husband drew a much better clock within hours of taking coconut oil. Uh, this was her clock, his clock, I guess, one day, and the next day, and the next day, or something like that. Um, uh, I'll leave you be the judge as to which clock is better. Uh, but on any account, uh, I, I've had many, many patients, as I'm sure you have, uh, who've uh, taken the coconut oil and none of them have drawn better clocks as far as I can tell, um, or had other benefits. Um, there are a variety of, uh, of uh, treatments that have been uh, proposed based on this idea that coconut oil or uh, medium chain uh, oil, fatty acids, uh, might be beneficial, but they have not uh, clearly shown a benefit at this time. So that's really, I'm going to finish up. I didn't want to spend too long. Uh, uh, basically, the current uh, investigational treatments that we're investigating at Columbia and uh, elsewhere around the country include passive immunization with cronezumab, uh, also the trials of aducanumab, as I mentioned, and beta secretase inhibitors, AZD3293, known as avabesistat, or MK8931, known as verabesistat. There's anti-tau antibodies. Uh, BMS anti-tau antibodies, other anti-tau antibodies. Um, there's there's uh, trials of drugs that could affect neurodegeneration. I didn't really talk about that, but azeleragin is a drug that's what's called a rage inhibitor, and that is not designed to inhibit uh, people's rage, as in, uh, as in behavioral rage, but rather to inhibit the uh, uh, receptors of advanced and uh, glycosylation products. And that uh, might possibly uh, uh, deter neurodegeneration. Finally, there's still some symptomatic medications, such as RVT-101, that are under trial, serotonergic drugs, which might benefit uh, people who are already on acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. And that's really all I was going to say today. Thank you very much. So I'm open for questions, if you have any questions. <laughs> no questions. some evidence that um, beta amyloid is itself uh, has some antimicrobial properties. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, so I mean it's been an idea since the beginning of uh, of uh, <laughs> of uh, having any knowledge about Alzheimer's disease, about whether, you know, somehow an infection, uh, uh, whether it somehow uh, might be responsible in some sense. There's really no evidence for that whatsoever. Uh, as you know, in some of the other neurological disorders, such as multiple sclerosis, there, have been, there has been limited evidence of some uh, 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 possible epidemics. Uh, for Alzheimer's disease, there's never been any evidence of epidemic or endemicity. Um, nor any evidence of transmissibility uh, uh, between people uh, uh, in any way. Um, there's been a belief that perhaps herpes viruses, which are widespread, might somehow be uh, uh, involved in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, uh, but no uh, good support for that idea. Um, so overall, it does not seem, there does not seem to be any reasonable, uh, uh, any reasonable data to cause one to believe that there's infections, or in any sense, uh, responsible for either the uh, uh, development of Alzheimer's disease or its promulgation uh, or its advancement. I guess the one um, uh, slight piece of data that looked that's at all of that ilk is the fact that it does appear that um, perhaps if you uh, 
do take in uh, brain tissue of people who have Alzheimer's disease into your body, it's conceivable that in that one circumstance it might be transmissible in some sense. And that was a rather interesting set of observations from people who had uh, uh, inadvertently uh, gotten iatrogenic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease where it also appeared that there was some evidence that Alzheimer's disease might have uh, uh, occurred at a younger age than expected and uh, somehow been transmitted in the same way as the prions were for Creutzfeldt-Jakob. Um, but of course, uh, we certainly hope that uh, none of us are exposed to brain tissue of people with Alzheimer's disease. Any other questions? Well, I'm pretty optimistic uh, with the, about, the, uh, about each of the categories that I mentioned to you. Um, uh, optimistic about the, uh, about the uh, passive immunization, hoping that we can decrease uh, A-beta, either through the uh, antibodies that are active against fibular A-beta, such as aducanumab and, uh, and its uh, relatives, or uh, antibodies against soluble uh, A-beta, such as uh, uh, cronezumab. Um, I'm also optimistic, very optimistic about the base inhibitors, which show an amazing effect in terms of the biomarkers, uh, whether that translates into uh, clinical efficacy is what we will know soon, uh, at least for the first of the ones being tested, very best is that. So I think it's, a, and uh, some of these other things are obviously not as well developed. You know, the idea that tau antibodies might interfere with, the, uh, with uh, increasing tau in the brain by, for example, interacting or uh, uh, alleviating the, uh, the interneuronal uh, transmission, if you will, of, uh, or spread of tau. It's a tantalizing idea. There's some uh, evidence in animals that such a thing might possibly be a, uh, uh, be a mechanism of, of uh, potential utility, but a uh, much earlier stage, at least for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and uh, some of these other ideas to prevent neurodegeneration. Obviously, it'd be great if we could prevent uh, synapses or nerve cells from uh, um, degenerating or being lost in the face of the onslaught of injury from amyloid and tau uh, mechanisms. Uh, of course, that's downstream. Uh, we're always happier if we affect diseases upstream, but we wouldn't be averse to having downstream effects as well. So uh, the only, what remains to be seen is how efficacious those mechanisms are. Okay, sounds like we've exhausted the questioners, so thanks for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to share with you uh, my excitement about these uh, future treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Good Thank you very much. Pleasure.